For the longest time, China has been known as the world's factory. I mean, take a look at the clothes you're wearing right now, the gadgets you have in your hand, and even the property in your house. Odds are, you will find that a good many things in your possession have been either entirely manufactured in China or at some stage underwent a manufacturing process in China. This could range from your jeans, your shirt, your smartphone, or even your car, whatever it might be. The point is, it's hard to talk about global manufacturing without talking about China. Or at least it was. China's manufacturing concerns. China's manufacturing activity fell unexpectedly. Investors are now wary of investing in China. Demand for Chinese manufacturing reportedly dropped 40%. The very catalyst that shot China to its wealth and fame, being the world factory, is eroding beneath its feet. Due to several factors, China is losing its place as the world's manufacturing hub as it undergoes a crisis that could threaten its very GDP and even its standing in the world. Today, that is what we will talk about in depth. And in case you thought this was something limited to just your jeans and your silk shirts, you are wrong. China's manufacturing crisis has the potential to change the global dynamics of power forever. This is no exaggeration. This is a fact. Follow through with me, and I promise this will be one insightful ride. But before we dive into the nitty gritty of China's manufacturing crisis, please take a second to hit that like button. One video I forgot to ask for a like, and that video was throttled by the algorithm. So that proves that your likes really do make a huge difference in the success of these videos. Thank you. So long as most people remember, China has been a manufacturing juggernaut. In fact, China is responsible for nearly 30% of all the manufacturing that is done on a global scale. Yeah, you heard that right. One country is responsible for 30% of the manufacturing process that happens here on planet Earth. Don't take my word for it. Take it straight from the World Economic Forum. You see, according to data published by the United Nations Statistics Division, China accounted for 28% of global manufacturing output in 2018. That puts the country more than 10 percentage points ahead of the United States, which used to have the world's largest manufacturing sector until China overtook it in 2010. When China stepped up, unfaltering during an age of its great boom, it simply took the button and hit the ground running. As more factories were built, manufacturing started to contribute more and more to China's GDP. By 2018, with the total value added by the Chinese manufacturing sector amounting to almost $4 trillion, manufacturing as a sector now accounted for nearly 30% of China's GDP. To see how huge this figure is, all you need to do is compare it to the United States, where manufacturing contributed to just 11% of the nation's GDP. It's a big difference, isn't it? In all fairness, a part of why that is so is because a lot of U.S. manufacturing work was delegated to China. It's not just the U.S. Several nations let China take care of their manufacturing with multiple big companies setting up shop in China. But why is that so? Why China and not their own home nations? Well, several factors contributed to China's rise in manufacturing grace. I must mention them now as I'll be breaking them down in just a bit very soon. The factors that really catapulted China to a place of advantage were basically low labor costs, strong business ecosystems, a lack of regulatory compliance, low taxes and duties, and competitive currency practices. Combined, China had the perfect melting pot, or should I say a factory that was unbeatable on a global scale. Countries like the US stopped investing so much in their own manufacturing industries, and they found it cheaper to just let China do the manufacturing. Although this led to the rise of manufacturing in China, it did accelerate the collapse of several local industries and the closure of factories in said countries. I will perhaps explore this more in depth in another video. Let me know in the comments if you want to see a video about that. Okay, so now we've established that China was the undisputed manufacturing hub of the world, and we have established the factors that led to that. Let's now talk about how they got into this crisis. Just before we get into that juicy bit, I want to touch on how China, using its manufacturing prowess, changed the geopolitical landscape. 
Understanding how China leveraged its position on the global stage will make you better understand what this devastating manufacturing crisis means for the communist nation. There really is more on the line than just economic trouble. Okay, so the China we all now know is a superpower, a world shaker. But that success it enjoys on the global stage comes as a result of its economic successes, much of which was spearheaded by the manufacturing industry. You would not be wrong to say that no other country in modern history has reshaped the landscape of global politics as China has done. On the back of the manufacturing, China rapidly transformed its economy from a low-cost factory to the world to a global leader in advanced technologies, all while transforming global supply chains drastically. It is no accident that China enjoys benefits on the global stage that can only be eclipsed by the United States and, in some cases, even that is debatable. China has won the game of international diplomacy, leveraging its success to become the primary trading and development partner for emerging economies across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Africa particularly has given China the platform to shine, further elevating the Eastern nation to a status of international dominance. When it comes to Africa, China has four overarching strategic interests. First, it wants and has had access to natural resources, particularly oil and gas. It is estimated that soon China will import more oil worldwide than the United States. To guarantee future supply, China is heavily investing in the oil sectors in countries such as the Sudan, Angola, and Nigeria. All of this is done on the backs of its economic partnerships. Second, investments in Africa. A huge market for Chinese exported goods might facilitate China's efforts to restructure its own economy away from labor-intensive industries, especially as labor costs in China increase. Yeah, hold that thought there. I'll circle back to this very soon. China also wants political legitimacy. The Chinese government believes that strengthening Sino-African relations helps raise China's own international influence. And this is actually happening. Most African governments express support for Beijing's One China policy, a prerequisite for attracting Chinese aid and investment. What is the island nation of Taiwan in the face of a billion-dollar aid package, right? Finally, China has sought a more constructive role as a contributor to stability in the region, partially to mitigate security-related threats to Chinese economic interests. In that same basket, Africa looks to China for certain things. Several African governments look to China to provide political recognition and legitimacy and to contribute to their economic development through aid, investment, infrastructure development, and trade. Where China shines in a way that even the U.S. can't is that China, through its vast resources, as a result of its booming manufacturing sector, relates to African nations differently. Unlike most European and American aid packages, China only engages African nations economically without condescendingly preaching about good governance. It is hard to get a U.S. aid package that does not tie in some sort of political favors, to African nations at least. China also funds high-risk projects and projects in remote regions that are not appealing to Western governments or companies. You would be well within your rights to say that Corrupt politicians take advantage of this and also take a good portion of these packages to feast on, but it does not eliminate the fact that China sends the money. This relationship that China has managed to cultivate only through economic prowess can be traced back to its manufacturing industry. What I'm trying to say, in essence, is that China's rise in manufacturing has given it an economic advantage that has allowed it to blossom. The geopolitical relationships it has leveraged have elevated the country's status to an untouchable superpower. Powerful African nations like these have all borrowed from China, thereby putting them in a position where, though not obligatory, is more beneficial for them to advance Chinese dominance globally by pushing forward a Chinese agenda. China's economic power has also resulted in somewhat negative global implications. As more and more countries rely upon China's manufacturing industry to process or make certain goods at low, low prices, this has given China a position of leverage that to some degree has been abused. While this entirely depends on what angle you're looking at this from, under the reign of the CCP and President Xi, China has become more vocal about its power aspirations and it has taken a more assertive international posture. 
This is especially so regarding Taiwan and China's several territorial disputes in the South China Sea. Combined with Beijing's military modernization program that has put Asia, as well as the United States, on notice that China's economic power will have geopolitical implications. Seeing how Russia recently abused its military might to invade a sovereign nation, none would put it past China to use its economic and military might to do the same. In fact, many say that China is using Russia as a blueprint for when they invade Taiwan. Also, because China is the economic powerhouse of BRICS, the BRICS group is gaining power and influence that is destabilizing the current world order. Whether that will be for the best or not is a topic I'll visit in a separate video. But the point is, China is most certainly, and has most certainly, changed the geopolitical landscape. None of this could have been possible were it not for the economic power that the nation derived from its manufacturing industry which has both brought economic benefits and leverage to the Eastern nation. Now that we've established what manufacturing as an industry has done for China, let's dive directly into why the nation is facing a manufacturing crisis and what shall become of it. This is the juicy part. You don't want to miss this. If you're enjoying the video so far, I'm sure you'll enjoy my other videos. But according to YouTube, almost 70% of you are not subscribed. Please take a second and subscribe down below. China's manufacturing crisis did not just emerge overnight, no. It was as a result of several factors that built up in the past few years. I won't go into every minor incident, but two main umbrella things deserve mention as they are accelerated by the collapse of China's manufacturing incident. What are they? Let's get into them. The first, of course, includes the US because what's a little China without US rivalry? Take you straight to the White House, the President of the United States announcing new trade tariffs against China. 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 Trade tensions are flaring up between the U.S. and China. Trump announcing plans to increase tariffs on billions of dollars worth of Chinese goods. I happen to think that tariffs for a country are very powerful. And trade war. China is now punching back. China has a 10-year, 20-year, 50-year plan. They've done some things that we don't agree with. We'll have a chance to see the new Cold War. China, due to the manufacturing and growth of its economy, has emerged as the sole rival to the United States' homogeny in the New World Order. In fact, when you measure the two in terms of PPP, otherwise known as purchasing power parity, China pulls ahead. All this naturally puts China at odds with the US and creates, well, some sort of tension. In 2019, China's total exports reached $2.5 trillion, with the United States being the top importer with nearly 20% share. Of course, importing so heavily from your competitor is not good for optics, so the US administration decided to impose a 25% tariff on selected goods from China. Trade deficits between the US and China are what had primarily propelled the imposition of these tariffs on China. The tariffs were followed by restrictions on both China's access to high-tech US products and foreign investments involving security concerns and by allegations of unfair Chinese commercial practices. This was not taken kindly by China, who retaliated in their own way, but the point is, the damage was done. When the country that imports a fifth of your goods pulls back even a little, you are bound to feel the effects. The US's actions on China, though improving things domestically, disrupted the global supply chain and slowed the growth of China's manufacturing industry. You can't keep improving and expanding when a fifth of your market vanishes overnight. The ensuing trade war that took place between China and the US was brutal, and it shook the financial markets of the world. Ultimately, though, it came to a heel and had heavily affected the relationship between these two top economic superpowers, drawing them both to a state of caution. In fact, I would be remiss to say the trade war is over. It is more like it has shifted to a cold war, where tensions just run deep and paper-thin diplomacy protects the peace. And even when a new American administration came into place, nothing changed. Despite pleas from the U.S. business community to ease tensions, U.S. President Joe Biden so far has amplified Trump's policies by strengthening anti-China alliances and implementing additional sanctions. In fact, in October of last year, 
President Biden rolled out extensive new restrictions on China's access to advanced semiconductors and the equipment used to make them. These particular restrictions require an almost impossible to acquire license for the sale of advanced semiconductors to entities within China. This move, as was expected of it, largely deprives the Asian giant of the computing power it needs to train artificial intelligence at scale. The rules imposed also further cripple China as it robs them of their much-needed U.S. talent, and it further cripples their own semiconductor supply chain. I have mentioned this before, semiconductors are the lifeblood of any manufacturing or even processing industry. Now that Biden has cut China off from that, well, it's a crisis. It is no exaggeration to say that, about the two nations' political ties, this could be the single most impactful and substantial move by the U.S. government to date in its quest to undermine Chinese technology capabilities. Its effects shall reverberate throughout the years, and we can only start to understand the extent of the damage as time moves on, and China falls behind other emerging hungry nations. In his eyes, Biden now characterizes the U.S.-China conflict as a battle between the utility of democracies in the 21st century and autocracies. This all plays out negatively for China, as the U.S. and their allies become less reliant on the nation as they start to look for manufacturing elsewhere. And remember, the money goes where the manufacturing is, and the money leaves where the manufacturing isn't. It really is just that simple. Now China is losing support for what it had made the backbone of its economy. This is the first factor that is resulting in the manufacturing crisis the nation is now in. The second major factor needs no introduction. We all know it, and it was quite a pandemic. Literally. Chinese health authorities are still working to identify the virus in the central city of Wuhan. At least 59 people are believed to have been sickened by the new virus. Fast-breaking developments in the coronavirus emergency. Wuhan, Shenzhen, Beijing. And a lockdown as COVID-19 spreads. COVID-19 cases in China are surging. And that's leading to key factory closures. Many busy roads were hushed as most people acted on the government's new measures. Factories have been closing down in China. China is struggling with a rapid rise in new coronavirus infections. Many of the country's 1.4 billion residents remain vulnerable to the virus. COVID-19 quite literally reshaped the way the world does business. When it hit, at its peak, the pandemic shut down the global supply chain, taking all of China's business with it. Question this. What happens to a country that is dependent on manufacturing the world's goods when well, the world closes up shop. It doesn't take a genius to figure that out. It was an absolute disaster. China, which has arguably been hit the hardest by the pandemic, faced a severe closing of factories. Together with the CCP's zero COVID policy, a policy that was so bent on eradicating COVID that it heavily punished its own citizens, China just went downhill. By the time factories started trying to open again, the world had somewhat moved on. And now China was left to figure out the absolute disaster of a mess they were left with. In addition to that, the pandemic showed many multinational companies just how much they depend on Chinese manufacturing. This came as a shock, as many realized that everything, from raw materials to contract manufacturing to production facilities, were entirely based on the Chinese supply chain. In a bid to rectify that, so that, unlike COVID times, they would never be caught out in the rain, several multinational companies started looking for alternative locations. This brings us to one of the reasons why China is in a manufacturing crisis. Put simply, it is the change in micro-trends. Everyone seems to be running out of China. But the question is, why? This is something we started to see seriously during the height of the US-China trade war. Because of the conflicts and the harsh measures the two countries were imposing on each other, companies from both countries suffered the brunt of it. This inevitably saw many major companies moving out of China in the search for survival. In fact, the country's export business was stagnant in 2019 for the first time in decades, and the impact trickled down to an array of industries. In fact, between 2018 and 2019, there was no noticeable trade growth, as you can see from this. This decline has only worsened as major companies continue to leave China. 
In fact, it has been estimated that around 40% of companies have relocated or are considering relocating their manufacturing out of China. According to a 2019 survey on tariffs conducted by Amcham Shanghai and the Chinese government. So Hasbro, Nike, they want to leave the country. Apple, speeding up plans to shift manufacturing away from China, triggered by recent unrest in the nation. Foxconn wants to boost its production in India as the company seeks alternative production sites outside of China. Many of these nations are moving to other Southeast Asian countries, not just because of the push factors, but because of certain pull factors as well. In fact, when you analyze them in a nutshell, the manufacturing in China can be narrowed down to simply push and pull factors. Push factors that are pushing major companies and their manufacturing out of China, and pull factors that are attracting them to other places. Let's examine these together, shall we? Remember when I talked about the factors that led China to global dominance in the manufacturing space? Well, one of them was the low cost of labor. With a massive workforce, the biggest at that time, and super low cost of labor, China was unbeatable. Well, until now. You see, that low cost of labor China used to boast about is no more. The cost of production in China, especially in the major coastal cities, is on the rise, fueled by escalating wages and skyrocketing real estate rent and valuation. Labor costs alone have been growing 7% year over year for the past five years, and these are expected to keep rising. It makes sense though. When a nation starts to develop and moves from developing nation to a developed nation, well, costs increase. As the cost of living goes up, so too do the wages of the workers. One thing that big companies like Nike or Adidas do not like is, well, high cost of production. As wages have risen, these major companies have started to leave China in search of better lands. Oh, I mean cheaper lands. This has seen a lot of big companies direct their attention to other nations that offer much lower costs of production. These nations include countries such as Vietnam and Indonesia that, unlike China, are still ridiculously cheap to produce goods in mass. In fact, let's talk about those countries for a little bit. I'll bring this home for a bit so we understand it better. Of all the exports that China has lost to the U.S. market, more than a third of that has been in the hands of nations like Vietnam, India, and Thailand. These are nations that simply produce products at a much lower cost than what China does. I will now talk about how China is moving into high-value manufacturing soon, whereas these countries are still low-cost, traditional manufacturing countries. This means that for most companies, it is simply cheaper from a resource and labor perspective to move to other nations. And to be honest, this is the nature of business. Everyone wants to keep their costs low, and unfortunately for China, this is coming at the expense of their industry, as other countries take the bag from them. The largest beneficiary of China's manufacturing crisis is arguably Vietnam. Let's look at that in depth in just a few minutes. For now, we also have other factors that are in play in China's manufacturing crisis. Let's look at them. China's new direction is, well, not really helpful right now. China has decided to evolve its manufacturing into high-tech, high-value industry. Over the past few years, China has poured more than $1.5 billion into its Made in China 2025 strategy in a bid to transform manufacturing into high-end, tech-focused industry. The goal of this is to stimulate the creation of higher-level jobs that add more value to the manufacturing industry. What China is basically looking to do is substitute traditional low-margin manufacturing with innovative sectors, such as next-generation IT, advanced engineering, the Internet of Things, and smart appliances. This is meant to elevate China when it comes to the value chain. The powers that be in China have made this the new direction. Without a shadow of a doubt, China's manufacturing future is aimed at the higher value addition sector that is already on the rise. On the other hand, traditional labor intensive manufacturing, which requires a low cost ecosystem to flourish, will continue to diminish or be moved to other sectors. Long term, this might be in line with what China as a nation plans to do, but in the short term, it's chasing away companies from the nation. The primary reason why most countries made their base there in the first place was because of the low cost associated with production in China. 
due to its traditional manufacturing industry. Their moving away from that is somewhat of a betrayal to companies that are attracted there because of that. It's like liking someone because their teeth look a certain way and then boom, they get braces. Though it is good for them, it takes away from that charm that brought you there in the first place. Hey, don't shoot the messenger. I'm simply letting you know why big companies are moving out of China en masse. Because of the uncertainty that sometimes comes with such massive sector changes, these big companies are starting to diversify and expand their manufacturing hubs to other geographies for supply security. This means that investments that could have been otherwise locked into China are now distributed to various places. This not only erodes China's position as the sole option for most of these countries, but it essentially diminishes the role that China plays in this chain. But to be fair, China's new direction is partially necessitated by the fact that, well, the nation's youth despise traditional factory jobs. And don't just take my word for it. Listen to this. The limitless wave of cheap labor that helped propel the extraordinary boom in its economy is coming to an end. China's economy is suffering from a strange mismatch between jobs available and the qualifications of the job seekers. There's been a huge expansion in higher education, an enormous increase in the number of graduates. This suggests a mismatch between supply and demand for low-skilled workers. You don't find people who are willing to work in factories. The upcoming generations of China have a deeply rooted resentment of factory jobs. And this is now contributing to a deepening labor shortage that is frustrating manufacturers in China. Do you see the irony of it all? A country of over 1.4 billion people has a labor shortage. Wow. I guess economics and the market have a sense of humor, don't they? The situation is so severe that more than 80% of Chinese manufacturers face labor shortages, ranging from hundreds to thousands of workers. In most cases, this is equivalent to 10 to 30% of these big companies' entire workforce. You can imagine how badly these industries are underperforming right now. China's Ministry of Education, which is notorious for biased estimates, forecasts a shortage of nearly 30 million manufacturing workers by 2025, larger than Australia's population. You can bet your bottom dollar that the actual figures are likely much higher. When all this is said and done, manufacturers say they have three main options to tackle the labor market mismatch. That is to either sacrifice profit margins to increase wages, invest more in automation, or move to cheaper pastures like Vietnam or India. As I've said before regarding cheap labor, Vietnam, India, and other nations are starting to prove to be the answer to this problem. So, since you guys have made it this far, I'm guessing you guys love keeping up with geopolitical news, right? Well, I've recently launched my own geopolitical newsletter called Global Recaps, where I send weekly emails covering the most important geopolitical news in a simple manner. You can sign up below, and best of all, it's completely free. There have also been several internal pressures that worked against China. For starters, the trade war, together with diminishing local industries and growing unemployment, have led some developed countries to offer subsidies and tax incentives to their local companies. This has been done in a bid to encourage their local companies to move manufacturing back home to boost the economy. This is a trend that has been forming more strongly in developed countries. Even in the US, we've seen this happening starting from the Trump administration proposing tax credits for U.S. companies that relocate their manufacturing facilities to the United States from China. In Asia, Japan's $2.2 billion stimulus package aims to help manufacturers bring production home, or to other countries after the coronavirus pandemic disrupted supply chains and exposed an over-reliance on China. These examples are less of an equation of low costs and more I focus on navigating a geopolitical agenda and alleviating supply chain risks. Ultimately, however, they all add to the manufacturing crisis that China now has on their hands. Also, we have seen, especially in the US, a change in sentiment towards Chinese-made products. This might be particularly worse in America because of the trade war, geopolitics, the spying accusations, uh, well, okay, you get the point. China doesn't have the best relationship with the US. In fact, according to a Reuters Ipsos survey, 70% of Americans prefer goods made in the United States. 
Now, the challenge remains that production in the US or most developed nations is still far higher than just exporting to other Asian nations. But still, those are factors that warrant a different discussion. Whether production is moved away to the US or Vietnam, the key point is that China loses either way, having been cut off from the conversation. Now, let's take a look at the winners amidst China's misfortune. Now, India's growing prominence as a manufacturing hub gets yet another confirmation. Foxconn wants to boost its production in India as the company seeks alternative production sites outside of China. Samsung set up a plant in the Bak Ninh region of Vietnam to reduce its dependence on China. Being in India is vital to Tim Cook and to Apple for the production. Tesla has proposed to set up a factory to produce electric cars for local sale and export. Thailand, Vietnam and India benefiting from China. China's mistake. I'm tempted to call these nations the nightmares of the CCP. But, I mean, that seems just a tad dramatic, right? Anyway, let's go through them starting with Vietnam. Vietnam alone has taken up over half of the US imports that shifted from China to other nations. This was such a huge market and opportunity for Vietnam that it has since boosted Vietnam's GDP by over 7.9%. This has been most notable in industries that have focused on the export of things such as furniture, footwear, apparel, electronics components, and machinery. To date, the US remains Vietnam's largest export market, accounting for 29.4% of total merchandise exports. Vietnam's exports to the US rose by 13.6% in 2022, with the bilateral trade surplus with the US increasing to 95 billion US dollars. Looks to me like Vietnam is coming for all that China has. What mainly appeals to the international community and US companies specifically is the nation's low labor costs. The very same advantages that drove China to greatness are now attracting a large pool of manufacturers to Vietnam. Several large manufacturing companies have announced plans to shift or expand manufacturing out of China and into Vietnam. This includes Foxconn, Apple's largest contract manufacturer, who signed a $300 million deal to expand in northern Vietnam with a new factory that will generate 30,000 jobs. This huge spending was in addition to the $1.5 billion that the Vietnamese government had said Foxconn had already invested in the country. Those sound like some pretty heavy investments, if you ask me. When you look at the facts of the matter, it becomes easy to see why. This excerpt from the New York Times puts it perfectly. A billboard outside a Foxconn factory in Bac Ninh advertised that the company is looking to hire 5,000 workers urgently, with an offer of roughly $300 in monthly payments for an entry-level position. It is less than half of the monthly pay, about 4,500 yuan, or $650, that Foxconn is offering new hires at its assembly lines in Shenzhen in southeastern China. Yes, you heard that right. Vietnam employees in this instance are paid less than half of what Chinese employees are. What this simply means is that the cost of production in China would be substantially higher than in Vietnam. Any good businessman will tell you to expand operations where it's cheaper. In this case, that's Vietnam. Now you understand why Foxconn keeps investing in Vietnam. It too is looking to reap the benefits that come from cheap labor. Why pay more when you can get the same for free? Ugh, I bet some capitalist sweatshop is probably gonna make that their new logo. Uh, I should probably take that back while I still can. What makes Vietnam's future bright is that it is not only more traditional labor-intensive industries such as apparel, footwear, and outdoor hard goods that are getting boosted in the nation. Much like we have seen with Foxconn and Apple, the electrical and electronics sector is set to become the next big thing to flourish in the nation. Even Samsung plans to move its display production out of China. And that's no small feat. This move alone will make Vietnam the world's leading display supplier. Just think about that. And let's just look at the numbers for a brief second. Due to its capitalization of China's manufacturing crisis, Vietnam has a strong economic expansion projected over the next decade. The nation's total GDP is forecast to increase from 327 billion in 2022 to 470 billion by 2025, rising to 760 billion by 2030. Those are not small numbers. 
All this translates to very rapid growth in Vietnam's per capita GDP, from $3,330 per year in 2022 to $4,700 per year by 2025 and $7,400 by 2030, resulting in a substantial expansion of the size of Vietnam's domestic consumer market. Vietnam has the opportunity and potential to become a juggernaut and more of a threat to China than it already is. Look out, China. Vietnam might just be your boogeyman in the making. Its role as a low-cost manufacturing hub is also expected to continue to grow strongly, helped by the further expansion of existing major industry sectors, notably textiles and electronics, as well as the development of new industry sectors, such as autos and petrochemicals. Vietnam already has a domestic automaker of electric vehicles, VinFast, which launched its first EV in Vietnam in 2021. The company is growing, and as it does, it attracts competition, or in this case, manufacturing companies, to China. The last point to note when it comes to Vietnam is that its rise has been boosted by China's downfall, as the pandemic exposed, well, a lot of things. For starters, the world's big companies saw significant supply chain vulnerabilities during that period. Having seen the challenges that came with centralizing the global supply chains in China, most multinationals have been seeking expansion. And guess what? Vietnam has just been in a prime position to answer that call. And this issue is not closed either. It will drive the further reshaping of manufacturing supply chains over the medium term, as firms try to reduce their vulnerability to such extreme supply chain disruptions due to anything whatsoever. Add to all that that the US-China trade and technology tensions still remain high, and what you have is the perfect concoction for the reconfiguration of supply chains. There is no doubt in my mind that Vietnam is going to come out as a winner from China's wires. But here's the kicker. They're not the only nation that stands to benefit significantly. India is another of the nations that are looking to capitalize on China's misfortunes. India, maybe more so than Vietnam, has a lot of things going for it. For starters, India boasts a large land mass and an abundance of labor due to its young population. This year, India surpassed China as the most populous country, and so they are covered in terms of labor. Unlike China, India's labor is not expensive, and hence they have the advantage. Certain companies have since noticed this and taken advantage. One example of this is Apple, which has already moved some of its iPhone production to the Indian states of Tamil Nadu and Karnataka, and is exploring moving its iPad manufacturing to the South Asian nation. JP Morgan analysts even made calculations, and their projections show that one in four iPhones would be made in India by 2025. India is simply capitalizing on the vulnerabilities that COVID-19 exposed against China. The need for Apple to reduce its dependence on China as a manufacturing center has been clear for many years, but the impact of the pandemic at the world's biggest iPhone assembly plant underlined the problem. The COVID-19 related disruption was estimated to cost the company a billion dollars weekly. It makes sense that Apple wants to avoid such a mess again. Julie Gerdman, the CEO of Everstream, a platform for supply chain risk management, said in a statement, India has a large labor pool, a long history of manufacturing, and government support for boosting industry and exports. Because of this, many are exploring whether Indian manufacturing is a viable alternative to China. The Indian government is welcome to deals, as Indian Prime Minister Modi has been working on attracting foreign direct investments since he took office in 2014, sending FDI to a record $83.6 billion in the past fiscal year. With low-cost labor available, low cost of production, and a willing government, it's not hard to see why a good portion of business is leaving China for India. At the current rate, India stands to take a lot of China's business. And again, it's not the only one. We also have the land of Muay Thai. Thailand is perhaps an unexpected winner from China's manufacturing crisis. When you take a second look, however, you realize this was meant to happen. As Southeast Asia's second largest economy, Thailand has been moving up the value chain in manufacturing 
and is a production hub for car parts, vehicles, and electronics. Even major companies like Sony and Sharp have set up shop there. Sony said in 2019 it was closing its Beijing smartphone plant to cut costs and relocate some of the production to Thailand. Following that, Sharp said in the same year it was moving some of its printer production to Thailand because of the US-China trade war. All these actions prove that Thailand's competitive advantage keeps getting stronger, and hence multinationals are flocking to it. Now before you start claiming that it's just foreign companies doing this, let me add this little fact. Even Chinese companies are moving out of China to manufacture elsewhere. Ugh, yikes. Companies producing solar panels such as Shanghai's Jinko Solar are moving their production to Thailand to take advantage of lower costs and avoid geopolitical tensions that China is always in the middle of. Amidst all of this, Thailand has just seen its foreign direct investments rise substantially. Between 2020 and 2021 alone, its foreign direct investments tripled, putting the country in a significantly better position. This was during COVID. One can only imagine the doors that will keep opening up for the country now that the global supply chains are being rewritten. And if you thought these were all the wins for Asia, well, you got another thing coming. We have other countries taking China's pie. Bangladesh is another of what you can deem China's competition. It has been a big beneficiary of the supply chain shift away from China, and its competitive advantage just keeps growing. The nation found its niche in the garment manufacturing sector, and it has heavily capitalized on this. The garment manufacturing industry is a key pillar of their economy, accounting for nearly 85% of shipments, or over $42 billion of the country's exports in 2021. The country is also the world's second largest garments exporter after China. Considering the size and resource disparity, that is quite impressive. Of its many advantages, Bangladesh's rise could perhaps be accredited to rising labor costs in China, whereas Bangladesh labor, in comparison, is significantly cheaper. Let me give you some numbers so you can really appreciate the difference. The average monthly salary of a worker in Bangladesh is $120, whereas in China it is $670. Say you owned a manufacturing company. Where would you rather set up in light of these costs? As Bangladesh continues to attract investments beyond the garment sector into other industries, I wonder how explosive their growth will and can be. Talking about explosive growth, let's look at Mexico. If you're not rooting for Vietnam, then you're probably on Team Mexico. What Mexico has in its hands is a golden opportunity as it stands to greatly benefit from China's manufacturing crisis. The North American nation is directly taking on China in the manufacturing market, and it's doing quite well at it. As US-China trade relations have continued to sour, it has been estimated by the UN that approximately $27 billion of lost trade between the two will be captured by Mexico. Yeah, you heard that right. That's billion with a capital B. And these aren't just random projections either, no sir. The food, basic metals, mining, pharmaceutical, and automotive sectors are projected to invest the most in the country, the latter a vital strategic part of North America's strategy to decouple its supply chain from the east and set up locally. Even Ford, the vehicle giant, has invested $260 million in its new global technology and business center in Mexico, while Volkswagen was reported to be investing an eye-watering $763 million in its electric vehicle plant. Flavio Barreros, managing director and Latin America supply chain lead at ActionSir, said in a statement, there is mainly an upside to investing in the country as North American manufacturers have a history of working cross-border with both Canada and Mexico, from raw materials through semi-finished goods to finished goods. Mexico will represent a key area of growth, representing one-third of new employment, particularly in automobile and food manufacturing. And you can't argue with how true this rings. I could talk about Malaysia and even other nations, but I'm sure you get the point. There are other nations whose own industries are on the rise, and any slip-ups by China are the windows for these nations to capitalize on and thrive on. Despite China's own slip-ups, these nations are emerging with just better competitive advantage, 
and that is giving them the platform to level up and potentially surpass China in the years to come. So, what are we left with at the end of the day? Let me state this unequivocally, lest there is a misunderstanding. As of now, China is still the world's factory. As much as there is emerging competition, China is still far above competing nations. Neither Southeast Asia nor India can replace China as the global manufacturing hub overnight. This is because they are mainly engaged in labor-intensive and low-value-added manufacturing, the very trend that China seeks to move away from. These emerging markets also don't have industrial chains and supply chains that are as complete as those of China. They might in the future, but I'm basing this off of today. What further gives China the edge that keeps them in the game is that they not only are a manufacturing hub, but China itself is a market for these goods. Based on its spending habits and large population, it provides the market for its goods. Don't believe me? In 2020, global companies had $1.4 trillion of domestic sales within the nation, far more than their exports of $900 billion. This means that they exported less than they sold. Tell me what manufacturer doesn't like that. That being said, countries like India boast similar advantages, or rather, the potential for similar advantages. Over time, assuming the same factors come into play, then yes, there is potential for such a drastic shift. In fact, the presence of nations like India is what is causing the manufacturing crisis in part from China. Only time will tell what will become of China's manufacturing industry as it is pitted against the younger but more competitive manufacturing industries of other nations. I will certainly work on an update as the situation evolves, but until then, only time can tell what will come of this globe-threatening manufacturing crisis.